You know, we of all people are living in an incredible, incredible age. For we today are witnessing the birth pangs of the kingdom of God which is soon to be set up upon this earth. And while the world at present is distracted with the shooting down of a Malaysian jetliner and the sad loss of all those people's lives, with the war that's going on in the area, Russia is backing them and all is contained and problems that they have in that area. Or else your mind might be distracted to the Commonwealth Games where they're running and getting medals and doing all that sort of thing. And if those things really interest you, oh, by the way, there is a war in Israel. And by the way, people are also getting killed in so many other wars in this world. And how many really care how many people are getting killed in Rwanda? How many people really care how many are getting killed moment by the ISIS group that's attacking Syria and are deciding that they want to build themselves a state, a state, a Muslim state, and they don't really care how many they kill to obtain that end. Do we really think about that? What about the war that's being fought at the present moment in Israel with Israel trying to outwit Hamas and all the terrorist acts that they are doing? who are willingly letting their own people be put to the death while Israel is trying to phone them, drop leaflets and tell them that they're going to be bombing that area. And still the world media blames Israel. And how do we think about that? Israel is trying to cleanse the land of the tunnels, the launching sites, which are launching rockets daily and have been for the past years. And finally they have snapped and said, that's enough. We no longer can take it. We are going to defend our citizens. And yet personally, how much notice are we taking to these events? How much notice are we taking that in all the world events that are happening, there is one key factor, that God is interested in Israel. And the other factor is that God through the Lord Jesus Christ and the angels, are constantly working in the earth today. And what are they working amongst the nations for? To bring to pass the kingdom of God. How many of us really take stock of the idea that God is working in this world and he will bring his plan and purpose to pass? And how many of us really think and understand that that plan and purpose is to bring glory to this earth by covering this earth with God's glory and he's invited every single one of us here tonight to be part of that glory. For the world events at the moment are steadily and progressively, slowly but surely bringing this world into that great day of God Almighty, the day of Armageddon and the day of the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom will reign on this earth. He will be a righteous ruler and he will rule over his father's kingdom with equity and peace. So our talk tonight on the revival of Israel in Ezekiel 37, well, we could say it's mainly taken place and sit down. We know, and this the world media is telling us, that Israel is what they call an occupier in the land of Palestine. By tonight I hope to show you that it is no such thing at all. The land was never Palestinian. The land is always and always will be God's land. If we believe in a God, a creator and a sustainer of all life, and he has put his foot on or his finger on a place and said, this land is to the fathers of Israel, well, who is man to argue that that's not the case? But you see, we live in a very strange age. We live in an age of humanism. We live in an age that media wants to feed to you what they consider is the right and proper way. And so throughout all of our thinking, the media of this world constantly bombards our minds to say what they believe is right. And you know, the sad fact is that the majority of people go along with it. And if the world tells us that's right, well then it must be. How many of us are prepared to pick up the Bible and say, what does God say on the subject? 
Israel is a fact today. She's a nation once again. She stands in the land and has been there for 60, 70 years as a nation, having risen from the scattered Jews that have been scattered throughout the whole of this world. They have become a vibrant modern society, a nation that produces way above their measure in inventions and in electronic goods and is way above its size as heard so much in world events. On the world scale, Israel produces more and more things per capita than any other nation. And you and I are privileged to witness this work, not of Israel, but the work of God through Christ and his angels making these things happen. Why then has Israel lasted for these last 60, 70 years? Despite all the hostilities of the Arab nations around it, a vowing that they will destroy her as a nation, vowing that in the past, over the past 60 years to constantly get rid of her as an occupier of the Palestinian lands. They fought in war after war, lost many members, spent millions and millions of their annual income that they might hold the place that they call home. And despite all those things, the answer is not in anything that they as a nation have done. The answer is in Isaiah. I want you to turn to Isaiah 43. We all know before we get there what it says. Isaiah 43, if this is not highlighted in your Bible, it should be. Because here is the answer of what all the problems we see about us in Israel today. And Isaiah 43 verse 10 states very simply, Ye are my witnesses, saith Yahweh. And my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and that ye may understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yahweh, and beside me there is no Saviour. And those two verses tell you and I exactly why. Israel has survived and exactly why you and I have a hope of ever reaching to eternal life. For verse 12 says, I declared and I have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, says Yahweh, that I am Elohim or God. That is very, very stated, clear stated. You can't argue with that. That is what God has said concerning himself and concerning the nation of Israel. You want to know why Israel is there today? Israel is there as a sign to you and I to say what God has written in his Bible will come to pass and it will happen whether you or I believe it or not. People do not want to recognise that Israel is God's witnesses. You take, for instance, how many Christians believe that Israel is a dead nation and God's cast them away. Some even take on the name of God's witnesses. Some believe that they are the church of the living God. The Bible says Israel is the witness and God never changes his mind. The Arabs all around them want to destroy Israel. Their common cry is that Israel should be ground into the dust and wiped off the planet. They witness to one called Allah and his prophet Muhammad and those only will they understand and yet, yet they will never ever prevail against the nation of Israel. Never. Despite the fact that at the commencement of the war, of any war, they are outnumbered by thousands and thousands of other troops, all Arabs, not one of them have been successful in destroying Israel. And that, my dear friends, is a fact that you and I know. It's not what the Bible says, it's also now in our history books. You don't have to turn to the Bible to see that it is impossible that Israel will be here. It is impossible that they fought those wars that they have and it is impossible that they won them unless it was a miracle of God. The plan and purpose and the path that Israel has to take against the nations is not laid out by them, 
but by God Almighty himself. Many of the people today, the churches and the Arabs, would like to take Jerusalem back to themselves. And Jerusalem has been a fought-over city from age of eternity. And yet they will never ever do it because Jerusalem, the city of peace, will never have peace until the Lord Jesus Christ returns and sets his kingdom in that area. Tonight we want to briefly pass over the events of the past 2,000 years of Israel's history. It has been one of constant persecution, one of much hardships for the Jewish people. For as God told them as a nation when they started in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and cursings, I will bless them that bless thee, and so forth, it goes right through. And there's only 12 verses in that chapter of the blessings that they will receive from God. And the rest of them, right through the verse 65, is to do with the cursings that will come upon them. And if you get time, note Deuteronomy 28 down and read it for yourselves. And you notice that as the history of the Jews for the past 2,000 years has gone, every one of those things that was spoken of has come to pass. They did disobey God. They were moved out of the nation and they did suffer so many things. We know Israel as a nation has been bought to and given the land of Cana. All right? We know this from the Old Testament, how they came out of Egypt, out of slavery. God bought them and for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness and eventually God said to them, you're going into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey and I will give it to thee. And they took it, not by their own strength again, but by the hand of God who was with them. They sinned and they were sent forth from that land. They were taken out of the land into captivity and the Assyrians took Israel from the north away into captivity. And 130 years later, Judah, the treacherous sister of, of, of Israel, was also taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Their history is recorded in the books, the history books of this age. The Bible said what was going to happen. And so, after a period of 70 years in captivity, you had the return, the return of the people to the land once again. Why? They had to return from their land of captivity to go back into that very land that was called Israel that they might be a nation ready for the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing happens by accident in God's plan and purpose. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, was going to be born in the, land of Be- in the town of Bethlehem in the land of Israel. And that was the Messiah that we understand to be the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And because they put the Lord Jesus Christ to death, who was the only begotten Son of the Father, they were once again turned out of the land. This time, they wandered for 2,000 years and the things of Deuteronomy snared them as they went from country to country, despised, rejected of men and a byword they were to become and to be called a Jew is to spit it out between your teeth. And yet God never ever forgot them in all those 2,000 years. And tonight we're going to look at their calling back to the inhabited land that they now inhabit. Promised to them, not only by God, but a promise to their fathers of old that God himself would keep them and give them back to them. And so the prophet Ezekiel commences his writings and he writes about the history of Israel, about the nations that are affecting it. He makes many predictions, things about the shepherds of the nation and how foul they were and how they didn't care for the flocks. He writes about their coming back to the land but the glorious thing about it that Ezekiel started to write when he himself was in captivities. He received his vision and began to write. He was called a man of signs as Ezekiel 24 verse 24 tells us. He was a sign and the things that happened to his life and the horrendous things that came upon him as a prophet that they were manifestation of the things that were going to happen to the nation. But God had told him that through the signs and the trials that he personally went through 
Ezra also would go through. So what was the purpose of that? That Israel may learn that Yahweh was their God. You see, in our own personal lives as well, our God brings us through many trials. He takes us through many paths. And at the ultimate end of that, what does he want us to do? He wants us to acknowledge that he is the God of all and that he is the one who will save us. So, as Ezekiel writes throughout his chapters, he warns Israel of their failures. He warns Israel of their lack of faith. He warns them that their grace is given to them from God, not by their own strength. He warns them concerning the judgments that will come on them and on their neighbours for their disbelief. These things, he tells them that he wants them to recognise that God is bringing all these things upon them that they might understand that he's working with them and how many of us take trials today is the fact that God is working in our life. We have to consider not from our own point of view what we think about something but from the point of view of what God thinks about things. And when we come to the judgments of the things that happen about us today, how do we judge it? Do we judge it by the things what we think or judge it by the things of what God says? And you'll laugh, I'll tell you why after. Ezekiel's prophecy then takes them from the time they were in captivity to the time of glory in the kingdom age. And that spans some how many thousand years? Nearly 3,000 years. Have you ever thought about that? Ezekiel does that in one chapter. A prophecy for all generations and all that time period that they could read They could understand, they could meditate upon and realise that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was interested in Israel to give them a place of glory in the time to come. So we want tonight to start in Ezekiel 36. Why Ezekiel 36 when we're supposed to be looking at 37? Because if we look at at chapter 36 of Ezekiel we will see an amazing thing. God is talking to the land of Israel. And he says, Son of man, in verse 1, you prophesy unto the mountains of Israel and say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of Yahweh. What God talks to a land? Well, 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 this is exactly what's happening. And he goes through in this chapter he explains before he talks about the people coming into the land what the land has got to do. Alright? So he says, Thus saith the Lord God, because your enemies have said against you, Aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Now now I want you to understand here that these ancient high places are are the things that God himself had set up. The holy places, the places of worship, the places that happened as a history for Israel, ancient high places and the people of the lands destroyed them. And so for 2,000 years the land of Israel was at rest from the children of Israel in it. It went down through the various people that ruled over it and it degenerated and degenerated and degenerated. And it was for a whole purpose and the purpose is because, verse 4, Therefore ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. And thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the rivers, to the valleys, to the desolate wastes and to the cities that are forsaken, which have become a prey and a derision to the residue of the nations that are round about. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations and against all Edomia or Eden, which have appointed my land, now, now I want you to see what he's saying here. He's talking to the rivers, mountains, hills, valleys, wastes, cities, all the things in Israel and to the land of Edomia and he says, which have appointed my land. 
Why do I want you to take notice of it? Because it's God's land. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to God and he will give it and has given it to the nation of Israel. Unto their possessions with the joy of all their heart with the spiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. So here's the nations rejoicing, rejoicing over the fact that Israel has been dispersed from the nation of Israel. But is the God going to leave it like that? Well, of course he's not. He's going to prophesy concerning what, in verse 6, the land of Israel, the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys. And he's going to speak about all these things and he says to them, in verse 8, Ye mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel. Sorry. <coughs> God says, there will come a time when you are going to become productive again. And he speaks to it. I want you mountains, you valleys and everything to hear. For behold, I am for you. I will turn unto you and ye shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you. And who are they going to be? All the house of Israel. Even all of it. No longer two pieces, no longer two uh, Judah and, and Israel, but all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the city shall be inhabited, the way shall be built, and I will multiply upon you man and beast. They shall increase and bring, forth, bring fruit. I will settle you after your old estates and will do better than, you, you, than and at your beginning. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people, Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. Bereave of men. And so the land itself, we know, <coughs> when Israel went back to it, was 90% malaria swamp, all up in the area that they settled. It was a land that was sparse, had no trees because they'd all got cut down because of the taxes of the, of the, um, um, the previous owners. You know, they had raked the land and it was nothing but a barren mess. And what has happened to it in 60 years? All the things it talked about to the rivers, to the valleys, the hills have been replaced. And Israel back in the land has rebuilt that land to a fruitful garden. And it's still going to be blessed more yet when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And so we read. Why? Because in verse 17, Son of man, in other words Ezekiel, when the house of Israel dealt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as an uncleanness of a removed woman. Therefore have I poured out my fury upon them for the blood that had shed on the land and for the idols wherein they had polluted it. And we know the foul practices that Israel f fell into. We know the death that they caused of the blood that was shed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then so verse 19 tells us quite clearly, and I scattered them amongst the nations. They were dispersed through, their own through the countries according to their ways and according to their doings. I judged them. And they, when they entered into the nations, whither they went, what did they do? They profaned my holy name when they said, These are the people of Yahweh and they've gone forth out of his land. What's the prophet telling, been told here? He's been told quite clearly that it's God's land, it's the own land that Israel should possess. They have been scattered out of it because of their own idols, their own wickedness and their own worship that was against God. So what was he to do? What was God going to do about it? Well, verse 19, he scattered them amongst the nations. Verse 20, they went out of his own land. But verse 21 he says, but I had pity for my holy name. You see, the work is not of man. It is of God. And so when we're looking at the subject, we have to realise God is the one here in control. 
I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned amongst the nations, whither they went. Israel is God's purpose, but they had defamed God and their dwellings. And all good Christians, as we know today, will always say that men are always good, but the Bible tells them that we are not always good. We can easily profane the name of God amongst the people that we associate with. And God, for his holy name's sake, despite ourselves, will allow us to come into covenant relationship. So it's always to do with God's glory, not our glory. Therefore, verse 22, Say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my, no, my holy name's sake. So there is an underlying key there. The house of Israel polluted the land, polluted his ways and were dispersed. But God has said to them in this promise, I'm going to bring you back, not for your sakes Israel, but for my sake. I will gather you, I will sanctify you and I will bring you back into the land. Why? Because of verse 23, Ye shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. And what do we read in, 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 in Isaiah 43? That they are God's witnesses and God will be sanctified in them. Well, verse 24 says, I will take you from amongst the nations and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. <coughs> so who's doing the work here? It's God. God's going to bring them out. God's going to bring them back to their own land. So who can say that Israel is not God's land? It is written, I'm going to bring you to your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, from your idols, and I will cleanse you. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you the heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgment and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. Is anybody going to argue about that? Why are they calling Israel today the possessors of the land? Why are they saying that they have taken it from the Canaanites? The Bible says he's going to bring them back. Turn back to Ezekiel 34. In Ezekiel 34 we read the same thing. When he's talking about the shepherds who destroyed Israel with their leadership, <coughs> Israel lost the plot. And God says in verse 13, in verse chapter Ezekiel 34, I will bring them out of the pe- from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and by the inhabitant places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, I will cause them to go and lie down, I will seek them, etc, etc. And if we keep reading through it, I will do this, I will do that, I will do it for the name of Israel. Israel is not back in their land because of their own goodness. Israel is not back in the land because they fought so hard for it. Israel is back in the land as a witness to say that God is right and what he's written in his prophets will come to pass. Well, how did it all come to pass then? He just finished all his chapters, the previous chapters explaining what he was going to do for them and now the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them and Ezekiel is about to see the witnessing of the returning to the land. We're going to read now in the last days, what has happened. We have seen this happen in our recent history. In the past hundred years, the things that we're about to read has come to pass. <coughs> Excuse me. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones. Now they just weren't only bones. Verse 2 says, It caused me to pass around about them and behold, there were very many 
in an open valley and lo, they were very dry. Well, of course they're very dry because they'd been lying there for 2,000 years. 2,000 years the land was without the Jews. So he says, well, look, son of man, can these bones live? Is there any hope? Well, what was the prophet going to say? He said, Lord, thou knowest. He said to me, you prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So whose work is it? The Lord's work. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, ye shall live. There's no ifs, there's no maybes. I will cause breath to enter you and ye shall live. For 2,000 years they had wandered amongst the nations and they had not integrated into the nations around about them. I venture to say that if the whole of Australia was suddenly thrown out of the land and sent into Europe and sent everywhere else throughout the world, in 2,000 years nobody would know who an Australian was. How many nations have ever survived 2,000 years out of their land and been brought back and still known as a Jew? I know only one, the nation of Israel. I will lay sinews upon you. I will bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin. So the base down, he's working with them. First the skeleton, then the sinews and then the flesh and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And there's a logic sequence of what's happening here. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a great noise. So, so, so this is no mistake. Behold a shaking. The bones came together, bone to his bone, and I beheld, and the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. So, so you've got lying before you a corpse of a nation. They want to be, be born, but there's no breath in them. So he says, prophesy to the wind, son of man, you say to this wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath came upon them and they lived and they stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Now let's just quietly go back over these events. You have bone to bone. This was the skeleton. And so what happened? In the first instance, in 1882, some of the Jews from America and other parts of the world went back to Israel. What did they do? They bought land. They started kibbutzism. They felt that it's time that Israel was back into the land, so they began to settle the land. But they were a skeleton, and very few supported them. Wealthy people like Rothschild went and bought, bought tracts of land. They set up farms. They set up people in them that were prepared to go back, but there were so few of them. The noise that was shaking, 1897, what did we have? Well, in 1897, we had the first <coughs> conference. The first conference of the Zionist movement. Theodore Herzl, a Jew in Barcelona, stood up and said, certainly next year, but within certainty 50 years, there will be a nation in Israel. And there became a shaking to develop that. In 1914, the shaking that happened was of course the breakout of the First World War. And in the First World War, what did we see? We've seen a Dunkirk, we, not Dunkirk, a, a, a Gallipoli failure, where they had gone, the nations, to the top of their land and tacked and failed miserably. They were all pulled back, they reunited, and what did they do? They drove up from the bottom towards Palestine and Allenby, who was the, 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 the commanding general there, eventually dropped things in, in, in Jerusalem and the Turks gave up without firing a shot and walked out. And the land became under the mandate of the British Empire. 
And so they went forth and they continued right up and eventually took and drove the Turks right back to the river Euphrates exactly as the Bible said they were going to do in Ezekiel. Jeremiah, all of the prophets spoke of these events and here it was coming to pass. Was that a mistake? I think not. So after the war, what happened? The Balfour Declaration. Why was the Balfour Declaration given in 1917? You had the shaking and now you got the sinews of a nation starting. And it was given to you, the Jews. The Balfour Declaration said that His Majesty with pleasure invites the Jews basically to take over the land. So now you've got some meat, sinews to the nation. What about the next thing in 19... The flesh came upon them. And so the flesh, the League of Nations stood up and said, this shouldn't be so. They were allowed to happen. And then if that wasn't enough, the skin then came upon the flesh. In 1947, the UN voted without a problem through, despite the fact that, that, that you had America and you had had um, Russia and all of the communist countries arguing and fighting in the UN constantly, they united together to allow Israel to be a nation. Do you think that's a mistake? Don't you see the hand of God working there? So 1947, Israel was granted nationhood. So here you have the skin. And where did they get their breath? You had a carcass of a nation and it wasn't until 1948 that they declared that the state of Israel was now in existence. And as soon as they made that declaration they had war break out on all sides of the nation of Israel and with such a meagre resource that they had they fought off all the people about them and they became a nation. And the sad part about it is through the UN and through the way that they had broke up that land, it wasn't feasible for it to be a nation. But through this war that they fought in 1948, they had enough tract of land to begin a nation. And so the nation of Israel began to breathe. It stood up a living being. But you see, they needed more than that, didn't they? They needed to be a force that could sustain themselves in the land. And so it was that over half, nearly half the percentage of money that started to pour into that nation as a juvenile small nation was poured in from outside the country. They grew, they slowly built up things and eventually through the war of attrition in 53, the Suez Crisis, the whole lot of them, they eventually had a problem in 1967. And when there was attacked on all sides in 1967, the Israeli army burst forth itself onto the scene as being one of the greatest army tactician fights that there was. And what through all of that happened was they took Jerusalem. And in 1967, the heart of the nation was born. And so they stood up and began to be the fourth largest standing army in the world today. The breath of 1948 had laid dormant to 1967 when they stood up a powerful army and put to flight the whole of the armies that was against them. And so they went on in this great strength. In 1973, the last time that they were all attacked, they stood a great army again and after two or three weeks of fighting the Yom Kippur War, Israel stood for themselves and it was recognised finally by most countries but never by the Arabs as a standing nation. And so the Bible says, Then said the Son of Man, These bones of the whole house of Israel, in verse 11, Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, our hope is lost, and we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, I will cause you to come up out of your graves, and I will bring you into what? the land of Israel. Do we think that's a mistake? Is it possible that Israel would be there today if it wasn't for the hand of God? If you read the accounts of the generals who fought in the war, they said as if the page of the Bible had been torn out 
And here it was written because these prophecies are fulfilled. They won impossible battles. They had impossible odds against them and they recognised that this was the hand of God before them. And as the Jewish soldiers in 64, 67, for instance, broke through the ranks and they got in and the Jordanians fleed over the back, they went in there and they found the Wailing Wall. So much so that the general, the first rabbi that went in there, he didn't even know where it was. And he's calling back on his radio to the units to say, where is the Wailing Wall? And when they found it, they flooded in there and there's these battle-hardened Israeli soldiers bursting into tears and crying against that wall because that was a symbol of the land that they had left 2,000 years ago. Did they do it by their own strength? I don't think so. What does he say in verse 13? Ye shall know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Was it a mistake that when the UN charters separated the lands and said you can go to Ethiopia, you can even go to the top part of Australia, we will give you those lands and Herzl says I will take it and he died of a heart attack. And it wasn't until the other one said we will wait till we go back to the land of Israel that God's purpose came to pass. And its own proper time, God says, I will bring you into your own land. Then shall ye know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, says Yahweh. So who brought the Jews into the land? Who brought them into this promises? It's none other than the Lord God himself. We find that far-fetched. Look at the history of Israel. Look at the modern warfare that has taken place in the last hundred years and ask yourselves, would that have been possible if it wasn't by the hand of God? Israel today is in their own land. And yet Romans 11, when we go to Romans 11, they, we're told that they're living in a land and that blindness in part has happened to Israel, that they don't understand their God, they don't understand the things they're doing, they believe it's they're there by their own strength and it says, and blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We are in the very last days of the Gentile darkness when the whole of this world is about to wake up to the fact that the God of the Jews is the God of the Bible that has got a very clear plan and purpose with this earth and this earth is going to be filled with his glory. There is a defined things in the prophets and when they are time to fulfil them, it will be done. What then does he say, continuing, we know they're in the land, we know they're there, and we know that we are now waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Verse 21, Say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from amongst the nations, we've seen that happen, whither they be gone, I will gather them on every side and bring them to their own land. Now, now that... Let's get something straight here. The amount of media pushing the fact that they are invaders, occupiers of the land, is, is, is not true. We may say, and I've heard it said so many times, that the Israelis are far outweighing and killing all these Palestinians and look at the woe that's going on and you have to ask yourself, why is this happening? Is it happening because they are fighting for their own lives? Yes, it is. Is it happening that there's so many of the others are dying because they are using mosques, homes and all places of public res- of places of buildings and everything as launching sites for their missiles? If I venture to say a rocket was being shot out of a mosque every single day at your house, would you not want to stop that rocket launching site? And if unfortunately Israel will ring a thousand people and drop leaflets to say I'm going to bomb that area and then when it's going to bomb the area it sends in a warning shot first which explodes with no damage and then a minute or so later in comes the real thing. If you had the brains to get out of the way you wouldn't be dead. But the leaders of Hamas are saying to the people you will stay in your homes. 
You will stay in the moss. You will get killed. Because the propaganda war to them is far more important than what the Bible tells us is going to happen. They don't believe Israel should be there. The Bible says they're going to be there. God has told us they're there for a purpose. On verse 22, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them all. Oh, hang on. One king? Well, they haven't got a king. When the land opened up in 1948 as a nation, they elected to not have a king. Of Ben Gurion says, I am not a king. I will be a president, but I will not be a king. Well, who's the king? Well, of course the king can only be who? Well, let's turn over the page and find out. Verse 25. They shall dwell in the land that I I have given unto Jacob my servant. We know Jacob is the father. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was given the promise of the land of Israel. Wherein your fathers have dwelt and they shall dwell there and even they and their children and their children's children forever and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Well, well, who's David? David, of course, was one of their greatest kings that they ever had. David was the greatest king that went out into battle for them, subdued the land, took it off all of the people around them, mainly the Philistines. And to this king David, as we all know, in 2 Samuel 7, was given a promise that he should have a seed out of his loins. And that seed just happened to be in the very line of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that coincidental? Can't we see that these things are so intricately tied up with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? The people have to be in the land. They have to be dwelling there. They have to be waiting. They're waiting for their king. And as they say, their Messiah. Their Messiah has already come. Blindness and part has happened and they can't see it. The Gentiles, the Christians as we know us today are being called to the hope of Israel to be part of this glorious time when this king, the Lord Jesus Christ, will rule in peace over this people Israel. Moreover, verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the nation shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel where my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Has that come to pass yet? Of course we haven't seen the sanctuary there. We haven't seen the tabernacle there. It will come. As truly as God has brought those people back and distinctively gave them all those things that was going to happen, we will see these last things happen that is causing this for us. This promise of the tabernacle and sanctuary is yet to come. It will come when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. These things should be a grave message for us to wake up to what is happening about us. Read the Bible, see what it's all about and get our focus on the things which are set to come very soon. Well, is this then the end account then of Israel's regathering and setting into the land? Or will the current conflict that Israel's going through Will that come to an end? Will that end all things? Will that bring the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us quite categorically that Israel will never find peace in its borders. She'll never have peace until the time that the Lord Jesus Christ returns. There will be a false peace peace proclaimed shortly. When Israel, I believe, has crushed not only Hamas, but all of those about her, and stop the fighting in her borders to the fact that she has made deals with all these people, when she feels comfortable in her position, she will make a statement that says that we have finally got peace. And when the cry of peace and safety goes out from Israel, sudden destruction will come upon her. Why do we say this? Don't they deserve some peace? Well, yes, they do deserve peace but they deserve peace under a righteous ruler. And at the moment they are doing everything in their own strength. The Iron Dome, the Sherman tanks, 
the Mercury, of, the, the Rolls Royce of tanks, the armament that the Israel has developed is phenomenal. Where's their trust in God? We may clearly say, well, if they didn't have these armaments, they'd be wiped off the planet. Yes, they would be. But you see, why do they have so many brains in Israel that can develop these things? Why is it that they even develop the chips that go in your computer at home? Why is it that they develop all these things that when they were threatened with Iran with the nuclear power plant, the Stuttnitz virus went out through these microchips? You see, there's many things that God given to Israel. Many noble prizes have been given to Israel and it's not for their sakes but that they might behold their God. Israel today has not done that. The time will come very soon when they will. Time does not permit us to go very much through Ezekiel 38, but Ezekiel 38, right through the whole of the Bible, gives us a wonderful insight as to what is going to happen to these people before their king comes. They are in the land. They are developing that land. It is growing like a garden of Eden. And if you go and see, you will see the desert been farmed with cattle, with goods, with glasshouses, with food that's coming out of the Negev is just increasing constantly. But will it stay like this? Well, Ezekiel 38, it will tell you two verses only. In verse 38, sorry, chapter 38, verse 8 says, After many days. <coughs> many days from what? From their settlement in the land? Yes. After many days of them being kicked out? Yes. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come back into the land. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. Which land was destroyed by sword? The Romans in AD 7, do you remember? 2,000 years of wandering, it's brought back. It's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So we know exactly which land it's talking about. Which has been laid waste. It's brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So here's the Jews today. This is exactly what's going to be happening. And what's going to happen? Well, God says he's going to send the nations against them. Go, the chief priests, Meshach, Tubal, and there's a confederacy of them. They're going to come out of the north. They're going to come, all of them, prepared for war and they're going to come across this nation. And what's going to happen? Verse 16. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days. Now, how many times do we read in Bible prophecy about the latter days? The latter days has always got to do with the nation of Israel and the end of the Gentile times, and that's the exact days that you and I are living in now. So, in the latter days, I will bring against, the, against my land. So, it's God's stating it's my land. I will bring against the against my land, that the nations may know when I shall be sanctified in the air, go before their eyes. And this battle goes on and God destroys them and we know the outcome of that. The magnification of God will be to all the nations round about that the whole confederate army is destroyed and he will stand in. And verse 20 says, I will be magnified myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. There will be no mistake who is doing all this. It is the hand of the Lord God. Do not be deluded by what we're seeing today. Do not close your ears to what the Bible is saying about what has happened in the Middle East. The prophet leaves us no doubt whatsoever that from the time that they were in a captivity we can all read these chapters in any age and come to the conclusion that at the end of this chapter, for the next four, five, six, seven chapters of Ezekiel, we read about the beautiful tabernacle that's going to be established. We read about the sanctuary that's going to be established. We're going to read about the temple where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to build and live in Jerusalem and rule from. We, my dear friends, have been given a part in that glorious temple age. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, Gentile or whatever you are. He doesn't matter whether you're a man or a female, a criminal or a good person. God is not a respecter of a person because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But what he wants you to do is lend your ear to what the prophets have said, look about you to see what's happening and realise that he has called you 
and me to respond to these words so that we might be part of that people who are waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ who in these last days when all these things come to pass we with the Jews will be saved by none other than Lord Jesus Christ. It is a real message, it's a real hope and the events that's going to take soon will be a very real event. This world like will be dispoled over like no other army has ever hit it. The world will collapse under the weight of God's commencement of his kingdom. He doesn't do it to destroy. Armageddon is not for destruction. It is for the commencement of the glorious kingdom age. The facts before us lay in the fact that Israel is a nation today. We are living in exciting times. We're living in a time that we can see the very God of all heaven and earth working amongst the nations. Do not be deluded with what you're looking at. See it for what it really is. Get ourselves together, get our minds together and together we might encourage one another to hold fast to the things that are found written in this Bible that God has not done all his work to stop now or he hasn't done all his work to let us fail. His son is about to return to continue the things that are written in this prophecy. Don't believe me. Read it for yourselves. Believe God's word and act accordingly. Thank you for your time tonight. Mm -hmm.